Assalamu alaikum and good, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the seventh uh, hands-on ERCP training course. This course has been conducted in collaboration with uh, Pakistan Society of GI uh, and uh, uh, GI Endoscopy. And uh, so previously it used to be Mercy School of Endoscopy. Now we are affiliated with St uh, Stoke Hands-on Endoscopy uh, Course Center, Royal Stoke University Hospital, Midlands NHS Trust. Uh, we are very fortunate to have an excellent and outstanding uh, faculty for this course. And uh, uh, this is one of the courses uh, that we conduct or we have been conducted, conducting since 2008. So ERCP colon and now um, this week only we'll be having the second EOS uh, hands-on training course as well. Um, our, um, it's an absolute pleasure for me to welcome our course faculty. Uh, they're all big names in their respective fields and they are like uh, an uh, outstanding uh, faculty, uh, very uh, good teachers. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Khalid Hassan, who is Director of Advanced Endoscopy and Fellowship Center for Interventional Endoscopy he is also associate professor, assistant professor of internal medicine in University of Central Florida. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mustafa Arai. Uh, he is consultant gastroenterologist uh, at University of California, San Francisco Medical Center in California, USA. Uh, then we have with us Professor Tariq Mahmood, who is professor of radiology at uh, JPMC Karachi. Uh, he's also the pioneer. He, he's, he's credited to have um, transformed the, uh, the Department of Radiology at JPMC and he's also pioneer of cyber knife technology in um, Pakistan. Uh, welcome uh, uh, to our national and the international faculty members. Um, now, uh, our, a little bit about our endoscopy uh, department here. This was established in 2006 by a person who had the vision to make this uh, department as well as this endoscopy center one of the leading centers in the whole of the uh, country and uh, he was the one who had set the stage and he brought in players and then he stood on one side giving opportunity to his colleagues and his uh, juniors to take the limelight and um, to excel in this field. And he's none other than our professor of this unit. And he's also vice chancellor of Dow University of Health Sciences, uh, Professor Mohammad Saeed Qureshi. Now I would like to request him to please come and say a few words. Welcome to our international faculty, Dr. Khalid Hassan, Dr. Professor Aram, Mr. Aram, sir, 
uh, the Sadmi as a part of the department. Dr. Tariq Mahmood is almost also a part of this department. We uh, ask him to come over whenever radiology is required in any other workshops or any uh, activity in this. Anyway, welcome participants, welcome to the seventh uh, ERCP course. This time round there are both the ERCP and the EUS course are one after the other and we have the same faculty for both. So I hope uh, it is an instructive time for all of you and when you finish with this ERCP course I uh, hope you have learned all the tricks and train, tra uh, tricks of the trade and are able to go and practice in your own units what has been taught to you. And please do remember that whatever you learn, you must then transfer it on to your other colleagues and not just keep the skills or the information to yourself. The faculty on this course is very helpful. They are very uh, uh, much available to all the participants and unlike me, they are cool and calm at most of the time. So you will have a nice time. So enjoy it and go back better off than you are at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Said. Now I would like to request our director, endoscopy, uh, and he's also a visiting faculty at Dow University uh, of Health Sciences, uh, Dr. Saad Khalid Niaz. Dr. Saad, uh, he is someone who does not need any introduction. He is a well-known uh, and a renowned uh, gastroenterologist of our country. He is the man who has taken this unit and this endoscopy department uh, to its glory. Uh, because of him, I think our endoscopy department is not only well known within the country, but also we have, uh, ha um, we have just um, uh, managed to get ourselves recognized internationally as well. And his services have been recognized by President of Pakistan as well. Uh, Dr. Saad, please, if you can come and give your introductory remarks. Assalamualaikum, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, just a little brief on uh, what this course is all about. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for starting a little bit late. I was due to an issue with the hotel uh, here in Karachi. But um, so hopefully we should be on time uh, and we'll try and cover up for the lost time uh, during the day. I won't keep Tariq's up for too long, so we'll continue the rest of the things. Uh, but just briefly, this is our seventh course. Um, as far as I know, this kind of hands-on course um, outside UK is only done in Karachi. Okay, so this is a great thing. This year, what has happened is that in we we started when we started doing the course, it was in Merseyside School because they used to do the course. They've stopped. Um, and so Stoke was the other center and I uh, actually uh, happened to speak to the, the lead there, Sri Shah Heber, who kindly agreed to, um, um, you know, collaborate with us and also give us recognition for doing what we are doing and hopefully uh, this year the British Society of Gastroenterology and the Royal College will, uh, will hopefully, um, the next course will be a recognized course from them as well. So we will have hopefully, and we've also asked them to, to look at the JAG certification so that it becomes a, a, a recognized course, not only uh, here, but also, also in UK because we follow the UK pattern. How did it all start quickly is that hands-on courses are difficult. They're not available. There's good teaching available in centers where, where my colleagues here come from but we don't have that here. In UK, they started this as the first thing. Before you could actually go into doing ERCP or colonoscopy or anything, you have to do a basic hands-on course. So that is the concept. And, and it's not like a workshop. This is, we've selected five people who are going to be hands-on. And those hands-on people are given, we try and give them at least four ERCPs with different faculties 
Before that, we will have some discussion. There are, there are going to be discussion about all aspects of ERCP and also we'll have a little bit of a practice on manicure as well so that you understand how, how some of the concepts, just, just to give you the concepts. Um, and this is about you learning. This is not about you becoming very good at ERCP after this course. That's not happening. And what, what this is, is, is giving you foundation so that you can then go back and build upon it. And, and eventually, because your foundation will be good, you should hopefully be able to achieve a lot more than uh, what someone like me achieved in, in, in almost 27 years now that I've been doing ERCPs. So we learned the, the difficult way or the hard way, and we want you to learn the more easier way. Some of the concepts you're going to learn have taken um, my younger colleagues here much less time, but someone like me who is slow uh, took me a lot of time. Okay, so, so that is, now we want this to be interactive. So we want you to actually um, ask us um, and uh, question us, and, and that's how you're going to learn. So there is no point just sitting and observing and not saying. If you think there's something that you don't agree, please stand up and say that we don't agree with that. Um, I'm once again very grateful to Professor Tariq Mahmood. Saeed Saab so is like, he's part of us, so uh, thank you for taking time out. I know he's very busy these days. Um, and um, my two professors, where is the other one? Um, Sharia, okay. So these are the backbone, these Professor Sajda and Professor Sahiri have, have actually helped us achieve whatever little we may have, we, we've achieved over the last 13 years. We are performing about a thousand ERCPs a year in this unit, okay? And um, we've now completed over 10,700 ERCPs in the last 13 years. All the records are there to be checked, seen, and, 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 and uh, hold up. A couple of new things that we've started recently just to help spread ERCP services and endoscopy services in Pakistan is that we've started these short fellowships which are three to four months fellowships. So you come in with us and, um, and then we, you spend three to four months. Dr. Dilar Ahmad was, was actually the first one who came here. And so you get exposure to a few hundred ERCPs before, by the time you leave and hopefully you know, learn some, some uh, you know, by the time you go back you should be good enough to do good ERCPs, hopefully, inshallah. With that, what I'm going to do is the introduction, everything else we'll do towards the end, because Tariq Sahib is here, so we'll start with the radiology talk. And then after that, what we'll do is we'll introduce the, um, the candidates and find out a little bit more about you. Okay? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Professor Sahib, Dr. Saad, it's honestly a uh, Is there a presentation? Thank you very much for providing me the opportunity to be here every year. There's hardly any significant role I play in this uh, course, but uh, it's truly a pride to be a part of it. Uh, yeah? Okay. Okay. Mouse. Pointer. Pointer pointer. So uh, I think it's more or less a ritual to go through all these slides. So I'll be talking about basic radiology, then uh, properties of X-rays, fluoro dose reduction, some justification, and practical trips. So modalities available for evaluation of ducts are ultrasound, CT, MR, MRCT, PTC, T-tube, and ERCP. Uh, before we talk about X-ray, it is very important to understand that still on plain x-ray, you can only appreciate five colors. So the most white color on a film is this uh, white area. And then the second most white area is, these are the bones, then fluid and soft tissue, and then fat and air. So on a plain x-ray, you can only appreciate five colors. And these colors are basically dependent upon the atomic number of an object. 
So anything that has more than 50 atomic number that appear as a metal on an X-ray. So you can appreciate this, the dense metal, these are also metallic wires of the surgical sutures of the bypass, and these are some metallic wires. So this is a one density. Then anything around 20 atomic number has uh, give you a bone density. So these are the bones. If you remove calcium from the bones, it is because of that calcium. The bones also become uh, black. The third density is the fluid and soft tissue. So our body is made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and they fall in an atomic range between one to eight. So X-ray does not have the capability to differentiate between fluid and a soft tissue. So that's why you see this heart as a one shadow. You cannot distinguish between the chambers and the walls. And then fourth density is the fat, that is a black area, and fifth density is the air. So radiologists basically make their provisional diagnosis or uh, narrow their diagnosis on the basis of these density. When we come to a CT scan, this same X-ray machine, the same X-ray tube, can give you up to 2,000 densities. I mean, we consider fluid as a zero density, and then it can go up to plus 1,000 or minus 1,000. So a, instead of a five X-ray density on a plain film, you can have 2,000 densities on, with the help of CT detection. So the X-ray tube is same, but instead of a film, you have a detector, and detector has a capability to differentiate. So on CT scan, you can differentiate between fluid, soft tissue, even the viscosity of the fluid. Uh, then uh, these are the basically the Hounsfeld unit. So anything that is a fluid that gives you a 0 to 10 density, uh, uh, and then fat gives you a minus 8, 1,000, minus 100, and air can go up to minus 1,000. Similarly, uh, the blood and the gray matter, white matter, and the calcification, their densities goes in the plus. Uh, MR and MRCP, I think you know, most of you are also familiar with this. So MR is another modality that can be used for detection of the ducts. So this is the gallbladder with a cystic duct, right lobe of liver, left lobe of liver with intrahepatic ducts. So this is the common hepatic duct and then the common bile duct, duodenum, and this is the pancreatic duct. So MRCP is again a non-invasive tool. There is no use of ionizing radiation. Ultrasound and X-ray is not having, or there is no use of any ionizing radiation. Whereas CT, MR, uh, CT, ERCP, or uh, all other investigations involve the radiation. Also, again, a good tool to evaluate uh, the billy channels. Uh, so this is the portal vein, this is the bile duct. You can appreciate stone with this. I haven't included the image of any endoscopic also. Naturally, you people are good at that. Then there is another modality that is called, in radiology we use, that is uh, called uh, a uh, nuclear scan or a gamma, gamma, uh, gamma camera. With the help of gamma camera, uh, you can appreciate uh, the physiology of an organ. You cannot, do not have a good picture of the anatomy, but as far as its physiological uh, component or its uh, functional uh, component is concerned, uh, gamma cameras are good at it. So another modality, a PET scan, or you see this is uh, uh, again uh, basically a gamma camera image. And uh, you do not see structure very clearly, but this tells you a better functional status of an organ. And this is the CT scan image of that, and this is the fusion image. So this is the PET CT scan fusion, nowadays, of course, needed in cases of malignancy. Uh, again, uh, image of a PET CT scan. I hope that all of you are familiar with now this SUV value, that this is a CT scan image of the PET scan. And this is the fusion scan. So on the fusion scan, you see this uh, yellow area. We call it a hot area or uh, abnormal area. And the, with the help of the computer, we assess its SUV, standard uptake value. And if the standard uptake value is more than two, it is suspicious. If it is more than four, that suggests that these are possibly the malignant uh, cell. There can be some exceptions. Uh, in some cases, even in tuberculosis or some other infections, but most of the time, if you have a radiological image and you have this uh, PET CT fusion image, you can distinguish between uh, malignancy and other diseases. Coming to X-ray, X-rays are basically photons or packets of energy. They are a part of electromagnetic spectrum, travel in straight line, absorbed or scattered in a different manner. So, previously, we were used to have a phosphor plate 
and a silver bromide crystal on an X-ray film. Now these things have been replaced with the digital scanner. So almost these are now uh, not uh, valid as far as digital imaging is concerned. But otherwise, X-ray remain the same. They are ionizing items. When they hit the living cell, they have a potential to damage the RNA, DNA, RNA, and can cause cancer. But certainly not in the range of diagnostic views. When X-rays uh, interact with matter, so it, it gradually attenuates. It gradually becomes weakens. So I've shown you a first pen that if you place a metal between X-ray and the object, then no X-ray radiation can pass through the metal, so the film area is absolutely white. If you, whereas the other area where we have an air, that area is absolutely black because most of the radiation can pass through the air and hit the film. So it again depends upon not only the atomic number but also the density of the object. If object is more dense, it will appear more white on an X-ray. If metal is more dense, it will appear more white. Like on the first film, there were wires were less white compared to the, uh, that marker uh, on that film. So density matters, atomic number matter, and then the gradually the density of the X-rays or when they travel in a, even a straight direction, it gradually become weakened. So X-rays are transmitted and hit the fluoroscopic film or uh, the radiographic film and pro produce an image. Now, when X-ray comes, if they are transmitted from this object, if this is a patient and these are the X-ray produced in an X-ray film, they go to the phosphor plate or a digital plate or the X-ray film, this will produce a good quality image. But at times, some X-rays are absorbed. These X-rays which are absorbed, they are harmful for the patient, but does not contribute anything for the image. But the X-rays that when hit the patient and they are scattered, they, number one, they do not produce any, uh, they do, do not help in uh, making or providing us a good quality image. At the same time, these X-rays are harmful for the uh, operator. So we uh, need to be careful about the scatter radiation. Whether they pass through patient's body and scatter in the uh, various uh, directions or they interact with the patient body and scatter directly towards the uh, operator. So the basic principle X-ray is that X-ray follow the inverse law. Uh, they gradually become weakened, gradually become wider. So uh, if you stand at a uh, distance from the source of the X-ray, it will be uh, less possibility you have an exposure. So it is important for the operator to understand that when you are using a machine, that is it an hour couch tube or it is, is it an under couch tube? Now, if it is an hour couch tube, the X-rays are coming from this direction, right? And there will be a scatter from this side of the patient's body. And you have to be careful about your, this part of the body. And if the X-ray tube, if you are standing on this side, again, you will be exposed, your, this part of the body will be exposed because of the scatter radiation. And if it is an under couch tube, then naturally, again, this part of the body is uh, most exposed part, so you have to be careful for the protection of that uh, part of the body. So you should be, if you are familiar with that, that under couch tube is having a more exposure to the lower part of the body, whereas our couch tube expose your upper part of the body. Uh, to avoid that, one should always uh, collimate the beam. So if you collimate the beam to the area of interest, there will be less possibility of the scatter radiation. If you are using the proper grid uh, after the film, there is a proper grid. So these grid also filter the scatter radiation. It allows the radiation that are needed to produce an image to pass through the grids, whereas the scatter radiations are absorbed. But because of this grid, at times you have to give a slightly higher dose to the patient. But again, you have to have a trade-off that you avoid exposure to yourself and give uh, to also to get a better quality image, you give slightly higher radiation. Uh, then coming to the principle, it, uh, again, one should be sure whether this test is needed only then. Uh, radiological test should be done. Uh, and there should be an optimum image with lowest possible dose 
but again, keeping in view that, that you do not compromise on the quality of the image, and then protection of uh, staff is very necessary. Uh, Dose saving feature that uh, there are no, most of the X-ray machines, they have intrinsic uh, filters to avoid scatter. At the same time, the detectors are also very sensitive. You need less radiation to have a good quality image. One should use a pulse fluoroscopy and try to use only when it is needed. Uh, last image hold uh, is again important. Instead of having a discussion while uh, doing an exposure, it is better to discuss on the last image. Fluoroscopic image uh, avoid high dose compared to a radiographic image. So fluoroscopy require very little dose of radiation compared to an X-ray. Uh, coming to the apron, naturally, this is probably the proper way that you should have a thyroid shield and the apron. Now, there are two types of apron, uh, 0.25 mm and 0.5 mm. Certainly 0.5 mm is better, but it is heavier. So what people do is that they get a 0.25 mm, but in the anterior side of the body, they overlap the, this area. So when you have this type of apron, you should properly have a uh, cover your body. Naturally, these are not the proper way to use the apron. To avoid unnecessary radiation, always use the protective clothing. Uh, always use a dosimeter. Uh, or you should always have a check of your tube uh, and its rating. Uh, and then, of course, uh, blood production for operator, nurse, and everybody else in the room. Tip to uh, reduce exposure, uh, naturally ask your radiographer to center the light and collimation before fluoroscopy. Uh, use pulse fluoroscopy, uh, always use cone. So if you use a cone, uh, focus the area, it will give you a less uh, scatter, less dose to the patient. At the same time, you get a better quality image. It is always better to suck out the air in the duodenum before starting the fluoroscopy. So you will have a patient will have a comfortable examination and at the same time you will have good quality of image. Uh, always check the assistant is ready before asking the screen. Stop screening whenever a maneuver is completed. Good radiographer will watch your eyes. Do not get irritated if they stop screening. Explain to radiographer uh, need for a prolonged screening if required. Uh, for patient comfort, uh, do not screen if patient is moving. Uh, check wire tap, amount of air, anticipate that dilation, dilatation will be painful. So otherwise, uh, naturally, patient get irritated and it is, you have to do a repeat the exam. Uh, awareness of the colleague, so limbs, if they have to hold the patient for a moment, because again, it give uh, exposure to patients. Uh, to conclude that, X-ray should be judiciously used, Alara principle, I mean, only when it is needed and as low as possible. We are maximum protective clothing. Use dose-reducing facilities. Communicate well with the assistant and a radiographer. If you permit me, I'll share four or five slides of CyberKnife. So uh, CyberKnife is a robot. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's new, might be newer for some of the colleagues that uh, it's a radio surgery machine, right? This robot, uh, sorry. Uh, this is basically a giant robot. This is a linear accelerator. And these are the various guns available. There's a patient here. And on the floor roof, we have an X-ray. And in the floor, we have a detector. So this robot basically performs uh, radio surgery. I mean, the commonest uh, way of doing surgery is by surgeon's knife. So in this, the cyber was the word derived from computer, knife from the surgeon's knife. So this is basically a computer knife. You don't use knife like a surgeon, but this robot is not competing with radiotherapist. This robot is competing with surgeon. This robot is also performing a surgery like a surgeon, but only using radiation, right, without use of a knife. So basically, these are the guns. It can destroy a two millimeter target with a one millimeter, 100% precision, up to six, seven centimeter target, right? So, but it, it, it is used only for a curative treatment of cancer. Cure is only possible when it is an early stage. Like in CA prostate, if it is a stage one, only then cyber knife is indicated. But if it is a stage one CA prostate, it is better compared to surgery, radiotherapy, brachytherapy, because there is much less risk of uh, proctitis, cystitis, impotence, and incontinence, which are associated with other, other modality. But otherwise, brain, spine, and other areas are naturally, it is uh, best at brain, spine, and other organs. But 
coming to the uh, gastroenterology part, we have done few cases of uh, pancreas, but a good number of uh, liver as well. Our second unit will be up by Maya, so we'll be doing more patients because at present we are doing eight to nine patients a day and there is a long queue of uh, brain tumors and spinal tumors, so they, are, they get the priority. But new machine has a capability to entertain 16 patients a day. So we'll be uh, doing more uh, liver and pancreas as well. So uh, this has a drone technology that this robot basically do not fire. Before every fire, it take a, target, it, uh, take a picture of the target and then fire. And if target is out of range, the robot just give a message, the target is out of range, it will not fire. So that basically adds up to the safety of this radiotherapy equipment or radiosurgery equipment, which is not available in any other modality. And second thing that now we are going to, hopefully in six to eight months, we are going to install or arrange another machine that is called tomotherapy radiexec. That is a radiotherapy machine, but this radiotherapy machine has a built-in CT scan. Again, it's a $4.5 million unit. There are so far 16 installed in the world. Hopefully, we'll be the first one in the region to install that. The beauty of that machine is that in, in, in addition to that radiotherapy machine, there is a CT scan installed in that, and that CT scan has this uh, movement sensor detector. So even if there is a slightest shrinkage in three or four days of radiotherapy, that it will, be, it will correct itself. So that will have, give you a precision, something like proton therapy. Uh, but in a much economical way. And we are going to hopefully install that in six, seven months' time. But at present, we are doing cyber knife. So uh, criteria for cyber knife selection for uh, liver is that uh, it can be primary or metastatic tumor, up to three in number. The total cumulative size should be less than three centimeter. Child score AB having a 700 cc or more normal liver. And patient alternative to taste and RFA now people are using cyber knives. So since this, uh, liver is a moving structure, so when we perform the biopsy at the time of biopsy, we request that there should be two or three fiducial gold marker placed in the lesion or around the lesion. It can be anything close to three centimeter of this lesion. So we need three markers so that because when liver is moving, it moves in X, Z, and Y axis. So our robot basically lock itself with, with these uh, markers. And then this is a, uh, naturally a, then a treatment plan is generated. These are the markers which are constantly uh, imaged by the robot and its imaging system. So one of the case where we treated pre-cyber knife after five months post-cyber knife treatment, we have done less than I think 30 cases so far. Uh, local disease control is again excellent or comparable with any other modality. Thank you very much. There is any question? Fiducial is needed in every lesion because liver is a moving organ, yeah. pancreas is a moving organ. Yes. So pancreas is a challenge that because we are, I mean, afraid to pass uh, fiducial in that area. Uh, but otherwise, liver is a very safe organ. So we can easily pass uh, fiducials. No, we can put the fiducials. Yeah, so, so, so yeah. I have so requested... Can, yeah. uh, so that's a very easy... Part. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you placed on. Okay. I think we have done six, seven, and in one, you place the fiducial. So fiducial is very easy for us. We do that all the time for the radiation therapy. Yeah, so, so, that's so, so in future we'll be requesting more to all of you for this fiducial placement. Once we start the pancreas mode, as I said that at present, we are overbooked, always overbooked because of the brain and spine. So that is not a priority. We are, we are more focused on a curative, to be very honest, we are looking for a curative disease. It's like BAPS, so that's percutaneous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So liver is certainly an alternative. Have you done uh, pancreas cases or no? It's, I think seven, seven pancreas, seven pancreas cases. Honestly, if you compare it with the overall survival of the patient, compared to surgery, it is much safer. But again, we are very selective uh, in, uh, I mean, selection of cases, right? So that if tumor is limited to the pancreas, we only do that. And if it is, it is extending beyond that, then we don't select that patient because we need a gap uh, from the intestine uh, I mean, there should be a fat plane 
or say there should be a two millimeter uh, gap between the intestine and the lesion. So if we get that, we do that. Okay, so uh, cyber knife can only destroy solid tumors, not cystic number one. Uh, of course, uh, pituitary microadenomas, but these are otherwise not visible. I mean, if, if uh, it is a challenge to visualize the small adenomas, but otherwise, uh, this can be a very good modality to destroy such tumors because you see, in brain, our results are. Uh, I mean, compared to any other modality, or much better than that, much safer. I mean, if patient has a pituitary microadenoma, macroadenoma, schwannoma, meningioma, AV malformation, metastasis in the brain, cyber knife is probably the best modality, right? But when it comes to a malignant tumor like gliomas, again, it has a limited role. It can do a local control of disease, but these people otherwise have a uh, rapid, uh, uh, say, uh, recurrent. Recurrence possibility is less with cyber knife. Okay, so one thing that any lesion which we have treated anywhere in the body from head to toe, there hasn't been any recurrence. Recurrence is only happen when there are you, some cells are left behind, right? Since cyber knife can kill the tumor from 1,200 sites, the normal radiotherapy system can only hit the tumor from seven sites. All the radiotherapy system across the world have a high intensity beam. It go in a coaxial fashion, it can hit the tumor only from seven sites. Gamma knife can hit the tumor from 208, cyber knife can hit the tumor from 1200 sites. So because of that liberty, there is no possibility that anything is left behind because it can hit the tumor from, four, uh, from all direction, 360 degree direction. So there, there is less possibility of a recurrence. So I have placed fiducials in pancreatic tumors, but I assume that's for cyber knife, right? But I don't know the data at our institution, but it's always in advanced cancers, patients who are not receptable candidates. So I assume they're trying to prolong life. Or okay, so you see, that is when you place uh, fiducials for pancreatic cancer, which is an advanced stage, mm -hmm. you send them for a radiotherapy. Okay, so, so they have a radiotherapy for, say, 25 or to 35 days, okay. right? So cyber knife is a modality that do a surgery. So it is not competing with radiotherapists. So it is for an early stage when it is within the pancreas. But now the machine I was telling you, the tomotherapy radi exec, that machine has a capability to treat patient of radiotherapy instead, with, instead of having, uh, say, 35 days treatment, that machine will be able to treat them in five to 10 days session, right? So that is the number one advantage of that, that tomotherapy can reduce the radiotherapy duration from 35 to five days, number one. And number two, with that therapy machine, we'll be able to do the stage one to stage four cancer. When we come at T4 lesion, we'll be able to do T4 lesion with radiotherapy. With this, we don't do anything more than T2. T2 is the limitation. One per month, and what about the pancreas surgeries, like curative, like distal pancreatectomy uh, for tumors? Not for the tumor. Take it. We'll be very happy to do that. Uh, by May end, we will be operate, uh, we, our second unit will be operational. And we'll be very happy to do that, uh, pancreatic cases. Yeah, we'll be very happy to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really good enough. And, and hope, inshallah, once our tomotherapy is installed, as I said, it's a new, new technology. The Varian is the leader in the radiotherapy equipment. They have not been able to uh, um, manufacture this level machine, right? So basically they have done, 
they have taken all the precision of the cyber knife into their radiotherapy machine, and now it is called tomotherapy. That has a built-in CT. The beauty of that is, naturally, when you are treating a patient, suppose if it's a pancreatic cancer, right? After five, six, seven sessions, there is some reduction in the size of the tumor. So normally, what you, you just take one CT scan, plan on that, and ask the patient to come for 35 days, have a radiotherapy done. Whereas a tumor has already shrunken in the size. And because of that, one examination throughout the procedure, you give more toxicity to the adjacent tissue. But once you have a built-in CT, which has the capability to correct the dose on, pay, on the table, so that will give a uh, more, uh, say, safety to the adjacent structure, less toxicity, and will have a better outcome. So we'll be happy to do that also on the tomotherapy system. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. more because of the EUS. Prior to that, a lot of these were obviously, you know, treated as maybe cancers or on CT, um, uh, you know, so I think in the next, in the last two years, we've started seeing on EUS, we've seen it coming back from, um, from histo you know, from cytopath. But before that, to be honest, it was, not easy because they FNA not do FNA, mila not get it, mila not get it, they didn't get it, they didn't get it, they didn't get it. I think it's going to change now and we'll probably have more info in the next year or two years as we increase the number of cases that we are doing. But it's not, it's not common. Let me say this, from the practice that yeah, we have, we've, we've done about, what, 13, 1400 USs and we have not seen uh, many nets, let me be. Okay, so what we normally do is we would like to we would like to know the candidates who've come here. So what I want to know is where you're from, obviously your name, where you're from, um, how many ERCPs are done, if at all, in your unit, how many ERCPs, what, how many ERCPs have you done yourself, what is your current cannulation, if you've done cannulation, what are the, what are the problems you face when you do ERCPs, okay? Um, and uh, what do you think is, this, is, is an acceptable cannulation rate for someone who is doing ERCP? So like five, six questions, but I'll keep prompting you. Right. My, my name is Dr. Naman Zakir. I am from Lahore, Pakistan Kidney and Liver Institute. Uh, I have been trained here in this unit 22 years ago as a house officer. Uh, and uh, then uh, that was when Professor, I think, uh, Azhar Hussain was here, I think, many years ago. Um, then I was trained in Akhan University Hospital, and then I went to UK for 15, 13, 14 years I've been in UK just came eight, ten, eight, nine months ago. Uh, there I have done ERCPs as trainee and then supervised ERCP as consultant for the last 10 years. So I've done it since 2008 or nine, almost 100 ERCPs per year. First three years I've done more when I was a trainee, but when I became a, an, a consultant, I was competing with a trainee as well, obviously. Uh, so I had done less. My cannulation rate at the moment when I left UK was around 70% for the last two and a half years. I have calculated it, got my numbers just four weeks ago from UK. Um, in PKLI, we have started doing it in the last uh, um, 18 months. I think they have done around, uh, in the last first 10 months, I think they have done only 17 ERCPs because of the numbers and availability of theater were less. In the last 10 weeks, I think they have done around 40 ERCPs. So their numbers are increasing as we are, we are coming into the market. 
I've not done any ERCBs in PKLI except three with uh, Farooq, uh, Farooq Khan. Um, so I'm hoping that my problem is cannulation rate. I can, I can do a stone extraction when, if I struggle, my trainer has got me inside, then I can take the stone out, crush it, balloon trawl, stand insertion, plastic and uh, metal. I think the main problem with me is cannulation. I think the, the cannulation rate for a, a trained ERCP should be it anywhere between 88 to 90 percent, if not 85. At, at least na ab above 90 percent is best, better. And that's why I've not gone for independent ERCPs, as many other colleagues might say that they are doing in independent ERCP when their cannulation rate is lower than 85 percent. So that's why I'm still continuing to do my training so that I can do ERCP safely. Very impressive. That's all I can say, really. Uh, because you've got a lot of experience, and most people in Pakistan, with your experience, call themselves experts. Um, so, you know, I think that's commendable. And it, that's very appreciated. Very, very, very appreciated. Very appreciated. I, like, uh, it's really hard to people, for them to uh, just uh, accept their limitations. That's what the problem is. You know? like, if you can accept your limitations, that's where you start learning. And that, and that tells us, that tells everybody else how safe you are. Um, Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Zabul, uh, uh, working as assistant professor in the part of, of gastroenterology in Ayub Teaching Hospital, Laptabar. Uh, in our unit, we have done around 300 SP cases in the last uh, two to three years. Uh, myself, I have done around 40 to 50 uh, cases independently. Uh, my cannulation rate is uh, around uh, 6 to 70 percent and uh, I want to excel in cannulation and uh, extractions also in uh, difficult cases of uh, stone and difficult structures. Uh, I want to learn more. And what do you think should be the, should be the cannulation Cannulation rate should be, I think it should be more than 85 percent. More than 95 percent? 85 percent. 85 percent. Bismillah ar-Rahim. Uh, my name is Dr. Bilaram. I am work is, working as assistant professor of gastroenterology and lady reading hospital Peshawar. I have recently completed my three months fellowship here in this unit and I did uh, about 260 cases, uh, hands-on cases at various competence levels and my cannulation rate was about uh, 70 to 80 percent at the end of my training. And on my returning to Peshawar, we have recently started uh, ERCP there and uh, uh, about uh, 50 cases done there. And uh, I have done four cases there and all four were successful. Mm -hmm. And main difficulty in, in my doing ERCP is mainly with the cannulation, difficulty in the cannulation and the second one is and difficulty in spring me and want to do this. Uh, my name is Dr. Atif Majid. I am an assistant professor in gastroenterology at uh, National Institute of Liver and GI Diseases at Dow University uh, campus. Um, last year I also attended the course. At that time my cannulation rate was around 40 percent and after that under supervision I had been provi pro performing ERCPs and now it's up to around uh, 65 percent. Still, I have difficult cases and I, have fear, I find uh, doing uh, it difficult when there are difficult cases when they come for uh, the cannulation. So we get supervision. Um, we perform around, uh, we did, we do around 300 ERCPs in a year at, at, at Dow. And again, the cannulation rate should be more than 90%. So my task this time would that it has improved from 40% to 70% and now it should be more than 90%. Okay. My name is Abdullah bin Khalid, belong to the same unit as Atif and uh, uh, I also perform independent ERCPs approximately 170 so far. But still I face problems there. We have uh, senior consultants with us. Dr. Nadeem is there, director, always uh, we have support. So in case we are stuck anywhere, we just call him. Uh, still I fail, face the same problems that many of the colleagues have said. 
uh, cannulation and also some other problems as well. For example, in larger stones, the extent of a sphincterotomy is a big problem. And sometimes when he, we, I just cannulate pancreatic duct repeatedly, then I sometimes feel that the wire has already made a way and it is not going anywhere besides where this common bile duct. This is also one of the frequent problems that I face. Cannulation rate is almost the same as other people have mentioned, 60 to 70, and I feel should be 90 percent or more. Dr. Ghulam Yazdani is here. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Ghulam Yazdani. I've been practicing ERCPA consult consultant in National Guard Hospital, Saudi Arabia. Actually, I've been trained in UK for medicine. Mainly, I was working in UK in medicine. For the last 10 years, I've been practicing gastroenterology and doing all kind of procedures regarding ERCP. Uh, I have not very high number of uh, procedures by myself, maybe 20 RCPs I have done. And by the ERCP rate in my hospital is about 100 per month, minimum. And uh, the oh. main problem for me is very, very busy. Daily 5 to 7 ERCP has been done in my unit. And uh, yeah, main cannulation is a problem for me. And uh, sometimes I say you go to the pancreatic duct mostly. And uh, sectectomy is also one of the problems with me. So I want good uh, training from you people. So I used to go for locum in England and Ireland. Uh, but mostly medicine and gastroenterology. But ERCP is not extensive experience I have. In such a busy unit where you're doing almost 1,200 procedures a year. Yeah, exactly. So why are, are you not getting opportunity there? there there's an issue because you obviously yes. you would do 20 in three yeah, days. Yeah, because, you know, the, the very busy schedule and mainly the opportunities have been given to the fellows according to the law okay. of the, you know, Saudi Arabia and my university. So mostly chance has been given to the fellows. So, because of busy schedule, we have been assigned for some other procedures and we have diff uh, difficulty having a chance to do this. Okay. So, uh, so, so, this gives us an idea about what we are, um, you know, what we expect from you and um, where do we need to work on each one of you. That's why we need this introduction, it's not for any other reason. And it just just gives my colleague an idea as well as to where uh, where you stand today and in the next three days we need to work on some of the things. Obviously, things won't change. So this course is not going to take you from 70 to 90 percent. This is a basic hands-on course. So it'll give you principles. Some you may be using. Some you may not be using the same way. Okay. So some you may find basic. For example, Dr. Sub has been doing it for a long time. So. Uh, he may find some of the things that we are teaching basic, but uh, for me, um, I think I'm amongst all of us here, I'm probably the, the one who's had the longest of the experience. But even now, when I sit down and see one of my colleagues teaching, I am thinking and, you know, it's, it's amazing how many times you pick up, Achha, this is what he's saying, or this is how it should be done, or this is how it should be explained. So this is not just about learning, it's also about how, how I am going to teach someone who I'm teaching. So, so some of the things you may find basic, but if you do, then it just just reinforces what you're doing. That's all. Um, so one of the so so again, I reemphasize this is a basic hands-on course. The concept here is to to help you understand and not train you as like you go out and you start doing. But hopefully, with the foundation, you should be able to build and go to 90 percent. Um, I think it's about, it's when you realize that ERCP is, is a procedure which has mortality and serious morbidity. That's what should never get out of your mind, okay? And sometimes as human beings, we just say, oh, it's a five minute job. But that five minute may actually mess up the patient completely. So as long as you never forget that this is a lethal procedure and Doctor has given a very good. Man has given us a, you know, a very nice benchmark here. You need to know your limitations. It's not that if you fail that the world's going to end. There was a time when I used to fail, 
regularly, you know, where you're sitting, I used to be there. None of us have just straight one day and next day we were all where we are today. It doesn't happen that way. You need to keep on working, you need to keep on, and you obviously have to have that passion. You need to get any opportunity you get to learn, you should. And even at this stage, it's been now 20, 1991, so it's been like 27 years. 27 years and any opportunity to see somebody do an ERCP, I will never miss in my life. I don't care who's doing it. I don't have a problem sitting and watching it. Because I want to see if he's doing the way I do it, if he's doing correctly or not, and if there's something that he's doing differently. There's always more than one way of doing it. And the beauty of our course here is, we don't have one of our colleagues, one of our uh, standard colleagues, uh, Dr. Vakar Ahmed. And um, because what happened was that we had UK perspective, Khalid would give us US perspective, and obviously I would give you a little bit of what we do in Pakistan. Uh, we are very um, honored and, and, and privileged to have Mustafa, Dr. Mustafa Arain from San Francisco, who's chipped in for, for Vakar, and he's just traveled, reached four in the morning from San Francisco. So just the thought of it makes me feel sleepy. <laughs> I think I want to go and sleep for him. <laughs> because I told him you come late. He says, no, no, no. We'll, we'll start. I don't want to miss out from the beginning. So that, that uh, done, what, do we, what, what are we going to do in the course? We'll have uh, some lectures. We'll put some case scenarios and discuss. Um, and, uh, and then we'll have the mannequin. Mannequin is the most boring part, to be honest. But you have to understand what it is about. It is about understanding coordination with your technician. Okay? It's about understanding um, what the wheels do, how do you move the scope, etc. a little bit. It's totally different from what you're going to encounter in a human being. But some of the concepts we want to drill in, hopefully you should be able to drill in. It also gives us an idea about you know, where to take you. Um, so, uh, Sajda, with that, is there anything else uh, that I need to... Okay. No, okay, so what I wanted to do was, when Shariar is here, I had sent him a presentation. Should we go through those cases quickly, just some of them, and between, we will do That's just... Okay, now, we all, you're all senior guys, you've done ERCPs, you're very well trained. So it's, it's about indications, I don't think, you know, there are some complex indications that we will discuss in case scenarios. But most importantly, consent taken properly. Sign kardo, bibi, case karna hai ho That's the consent, by and large in Pakistan. Okay? Dekhe, khatra bhi isko high risk kara do. Okay? But is that the right way? You do that. With my family, you know, you're going to get something really bad from my end. So we don't do it. When we are working in the government hospital, when we know the patients cannot, you come to my high-end practice, the guys are going to make your life difficult. You probably may not be even allowed to practice in that hospital again. So what we need to do is make a, make a practice which is very similar. So at least tell the patient that, look, I tell my patients my success. So you need to know what your success is. Okay? What um, is the shame in this? If we do all things, with due respect to everybody, including myself, we do all things in Islam, but we don't talk about it. If you don't tell someone this, what is your success? Or if you don't tell complications, then this is एक किस्म का झूठ या फरेब ही हुआ तो हमारी फील्ड में ये बड़ा जरूरी है ना कि आप उनको बताएं पैंक्रेटाइटिस का क्या रिस्क है आपका डोंट कोट व्हाट खालिद और मुस्तफाज रिस्क आर व्हाट व्हाट स्टडीज हैव शोन यू बिकॉज़ दैट मे नॉट अप्लाई टू यू डोंट कोट दैट यू नो व्हाट 99% ऑफ आवर ईआरसीपीज आर सक्सेसफुल अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह दिस विल बी दिस इज आवर सेवंथ कोर्स एंड फॉर लास्ट सिक्स कोर्स वी हैव डन 100 एंड 40 some ERCPs and uh, Alhamdulillah 140 plus ERCPs not one failure in the course. So we've shown that that is possible and with very few needle knives, very few needle knives. 
द रीजन वाई वी वर आस्किंग यू कि आपकी क्या कैनुलेशन है एंड प्लीज चिप इन वेन यू वॉन्ट टू क्या कैनुलेशन है इज बिकॉज इफ यू आई नो पीपल ऑफ आई सॉ डॉक्टर खालिद डू नीडल नाइफ यार कुछ नहीं होता ऐसे कट करो अंदर चले जाते हैं ठीक है इट्स नॉट ऐसे कट करो अंदर चले जाते हैं यू हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड ठीक है यू कैन नॉट डू इफ यू स्टार्ट डूइंग नीडल नाइफ अर्ली then you are not going to achieve that cannulation which is acceptable and when somebody is going to audit your unit especially if you are doing 200 cases 150 cases a year they will say well hang on a minute hamare yahan to hai nahi na agar accountability hoti uk mein hota to har case record ho raha now uk every case that is done is actually centrally recorded and they tell you end of the few months or whatever they are following will tell you my dear what are you doing your sedation is too high and if you don't change you're going to go back to training again no matter how senior no matter how good you are so uk is now a completely centralized system every procedure everybody doing is monitored theek hai na hamare yahan to nahi hai to i was reassessed by two colleagues before i was given the opportunity to go to hospital because they they'll stop and check yahan there is no so aapka check ye hai na और आप हम सब बड़े मतलब पाकिस्तानी तो सबसे ज़्यादा रिलीजियस लोग हैं इस दुनिया में तो हमें आंसरेबल तो अल्लाह की तरफ से होना है ना ये ये अगर नहीं भी अकाउंटेबिलिटी है तो क्या है भाई जान यहाँ पता होता जब आप गलत कर रहे हैं यू नीड टू फॉलो दिस इट टेल्स यू यू आर डूइंग द रॉन्ग थिंग सो इम्पॉर्टेंट कोट टेल दैम वॉट द रिस्क आर टेल दैम वॉट योर सक्सेस इज ठीक है एंड इफ कॉम्प्लिकेशन अकर्स विच अकर्स with the best in the world then you take them through it's not about doing a complication it's about not hiding the complication it's about helping your patient who's got into trouble uh, maybe because of our error maybe just because of the risk of the procedure taking them through my first gift in pakistan that i got from a patient was after i had actually um, caused bleeding okay this was very early 2000 1997 96 um and uh, portal uh, gastro uh, uh, colon geopathy and all and uh, i did a sphincterotomy and bled i told the surgeon we'll be able to manage it usko waise maine surgeon naya naya mein aaya tha england se and said no 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 we don't wait we open up he opened up he couldn't do anything patient settled but i took him through that complication i stood by him and end of the day he gave me a gift i said tumhe mujhe gift dene ki zarurat nahi thi bhai daantne ki zarurat thi halaki kusoor mera nahi tha lekin phir bhi you know so consent is important and in that consent you tell patients indications you know i don't have to discuss them you know when not to do it theek hai na and and that's important high risk patients you know the young female questionable sphincter of audi kind of thing not sure you know you are getting into the dangerous territory so best avoid it especially early on you can let somebody else take the chance and suffer okay and with now newer med- modalities i think you know you less and less uh, need um very large stone on mr cp or ct or ultrasound when you look at it and you say yaar nahi nahi main kar to deta hu should you or should you not be doing it? that's a question i don't want to say that you are doing right or wrong you have to ask yourself okay um, one of the problems i have uh, mustafa and khalid aap log ko ye nahi face karna padta when my colleagues fail how many times khalid you get referrals from people who are doing regular good ercps themselves because they feel you would be able to do something that they haven't is that something that you normally see regularly right in our part of the city majority of the guys who do ercps there who come and attended course as well they would rather get ptc they would rather send the patient to surgeon than to send the patient to us no it It, we have the same problem too but of not that magnitude yeah so the problem we Amar have to, to yeah koi chance hi nahi hai 
because the feeling is except to be honest one unit which is hyderabad regular and jitne bhi is interior wale and what i have noticed i was telling you in the car the level of expertise is gone over a period of time is really gone high with amir and sadik now their referrals are few and when their referrals come i am awake because i know it's not going to be easy and and uh, i think there is no harm agar aap kisi ke paas patient bheje acha hota kya hai i we have been delayed by dr ali taj because he had some issue with his knee and he's not been well we i told you guys but i'll tell you we've done over 160 cases this is going back like 3 years ago ali has been writing up about the masla you 160 patients came to us majority not referred majority came here say sunke of the 160 patients that came to us who failed in different units of karachi and pakistan we were able to cannulate first time in 92% of them of those 92% only 30% were done by me 70% were done by my colleagues i didn't even do that the remainder of the 8% were usme se all patients were done on the second go and one patient required three procedures 100% we were able to cannulate those who failed elsewhere we have actually it should have been submitted for publication and the point that we were actually saying was kid you have to look around and say whether should the buck stop where you are or is it what is the best for your patient is ptc something that you would send the patient for and get done when you can i mean it's a standard procedure surgery maine dekha hai colidoco gynostomy hepatico gynostomy patients been referred and came and it was a 10 minute job and done so i think that's something that we all owe, whether it's me um and uh, if khalid and mustafa are coming eus um i can do okay just about and if when they are coming i make sure that if there's anything that i am not sure of their patients are there so that i learn and and get better so that wo uh, sajda they were supposed to put this on the line but i'll just the leave slide isme aagi the dikha de quickly we'll just do a couple of cases and then we are we're through to this आपको भी भेजी थी ना केस सिनारी बीच में जो भी सवाल करना है आप सवाल कर लें आई थिंक यू नो एटी फाइव टू नाइन्टी परसेंट आई मीन आई एम खालिद एंड मुस्तफा वुड यू एग्री getting into the pancreas is not a problem actually that makes cannulation easier it's knowing what to do when you get into the pancreas that i teach my fellows if you get the pancreas take it because that's going to reduce your cannulation time significantly it's just about being appreciative of the different techniques that are available and using the one that works best for that situation you can't apply and we're going to go over all this i'm sure in more yeah. detail but in the next but I just that 
it was interesting the the similar cannulation rates of about 70 percent but also this concern of repeatedly cannulating pd and we know that causes problems but there are ways to actually use that to your advantage so each individual case is different and each has to be sort of catered technique has to be catered for the case but if i was to imagine myself sitting where you guys are sitting one of the problems i would have asked you guys was selective cannulation you know that that was an issue when i was how the hell does he get into CBD when I want CBD, you know, my boss? And I would get into PD, and I would get into CBD. If I wanted CBD, I would get into PD. If I wanted yeah. PD, it's I would get into CBD. Yeah. It's so always the case. Like, whatever drug you want, you never get into yeah. that, right? Yeah, so, so if you want a PD, you always get into the drug. So, yeah. so that when was when I, I was just imagining, if I was sitting on this stage, then my question is, what would be I? What would I be asking at the end? How the hell do you guys get into two ducks? But uh, and I tell my fellows that whichever, especially in the pancreatic case, I say, whichever duct you get, it'll be a success. But I can guarantee you'll get bile duct first. Or it's So, um, but selective. I think that term misleads people because I think now that the techniques have evolved. Selective is not that big a deal. Obviously, our goal is biliary in most of these cases, right? But it's, it's, if you use the pancreas to your advantage and get into bile duct, you got selective bile duct after pancreatics. It's all how you define it. So. And I was amazed to see Dr. Reddy from India. He would say, we're going to go into PD and he'll go there. We're going to go into CD and he'll go there. Well, with experience, with experience, most of us are able to do that. If I, I mean, I don't know, but most of my cases now are pancreatic. I, I think in this unit, maybe 10, 20 percent of CBD maximum. 80 percent of my cases are pancreas. So I need to get into pancreas. And you know, uh, what I'm saying is that when you were learning, and when I was learning, there were so many accessories that I was telling you today. The wire guided came in front of me. Before that, there was no wire guided sphincterotome. So, wo long nose, I don't know who's going to Anyway, we'll quickly go through two or three cases, and then the next thing we want to do is, uh, is uh, uh, cannulation technique. Or, no, first we'll do cannulation technique, or we'll do this first. So, that's the scenario. 51 year old female, cholangitis, jaundiced. Cholestatic LFTs, high CRP, ultrasound, multiple stones, non dilated 7 mm, I'm not sure, no stones. What is the next option? Hmm? MRCP, okay. So let's do an MRCP. Okay, MRCP within a week for UK is okay. We have to get it done same day. Maximum within 24 hours. Right? Yeah, yeah. Is, you, you guys will be here in 24 hours. Yeah. OK, no. So we would, no, the, the, the issue was that this is, this is what they're saying. The real yeah, scenario yeah. is that, yes. and how does it get delayed? It get, gets delayed in our practice is that patient comes to me. Then goes to, after I t tell him that he has ERCP, I said, look, he has pancreatitis. He said, okay. Hello. Hello. He called the phone to Afzal. He said, let's leave the doctor with the doctor. Now, let's go to Dr. Abdullah. Now, he took Dr. Abdullah's appointment. He got Dr. Abdullah's appointment with the person. He said, okay, there's no problem. He went to Dr. Abdullah and said, we do this, that he agrees with me. He said, no, ERCP, so you should do it. You should do it. You should do it. उसने घर आके कहा उसने कहा यार वो मैंने फारूक से पता किया था वो एक और बड़े अच्छे डॉक्टर हैं डॉक्टर मुस्तफा वो अमेरिका में हैं उनको लिखो अब उन्होंने अमेरिका भेजी वीडियो ये मैं आपको रियल लाइफ बता रहा हूँ अमेरिका गई अमेरिका से उन्होंने मुस्तफा ने कहा वो भाई फॉरन एमआरसीपी करो ठीक है देखो तो क्या हो रहा है ई आर सी पी करो या एम आर सी पी करो अब वो जो है ना पाँचवें दिन उन्होंने एम आर सी पी कराया जब एम आर सी पी कराया उन्होंने तो टू स्मॉल स्टोन व सीन एंड अगेन द सी बी डी सेवन एम एम and after this, there was a three days delay because again they would go hunt, you know. So when the, the patient came three days later for ERCP, his, his LFTs and CRP had almost settled. 
What would you do now? थे CBD में थे CBD में थे ठीक है लेकिन अब उसके LFTs ठीक हो गए पेन सेटल हो गया CRP सेटल हो गया LFT सेटल हो गए He's got gallstones in the gallbladder. Follow him for what? Surgery? Okay, so gallbladder. Okay. Anybody else? Why do you say that? Why surgery? Why not just? Or why not something else? Sorry. The patient is in place, the CBD is normal, and I'm not disagreeing with what you said. I'm asking why. So that's a good point. Why do surgery? ERCP is not doing it. I think that the best option would be for this patient, uh, I feel we all, okay, the patient should go to a, to a surgeon and obviously what I tell my surgeon is that, look, this is a, there is a possibility there may be a small stone in the CBD. So if they have facilities to do per operative cholangiogram, that would be great. Now because if they find a stone and you have a somebody who can do ERCP, then immediately next day karke aap ERCP stone nikal denge. Or agar cholangiogram mein nahi hai, to patient ko aapne bacha liya ek procedure se. Dekhe, isme procedure se bachne ka bhi masla hai na. Agar aapne ERCP ki achha, isme ek scenario change kar dein. In, for anybody who wanted to do ERCP, I would not question them. I don't think they're, you know, they're absolutely wrong nahi ho sakta. Because I do an ERCP and I find a stone, I'll pat my back and I'll say, See, right decision. Yeah, what happens is sometimes the stone gets stuck. Yeah. It goes down, down or goes, goes up. Back. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's not like wrong doing a ERCP. Uh, then the uh, other different scenario would be if you don't have the uh, ability to do a, uh, a cooperative collegio, you're still worried about. So let, let me make it more difficult. I am an aggressive person. Personally, I would do an ERCP. So I went in, put dye in, there is no stone. Now what? Do a sphincterotomy or no? There is no stone. There is no obstruction. So, so why, do, why would you want to put a stone? Huh? You want to prevent another stone coming. Then you will have to go back again and then take the stent out. I, I have this situation sometimes. Yeah. So generally though, it's a very point of very valid that 
look at the data, there are popular today studies, I think it's from Finland, clearing the bile duct versus not clearing the duct, that is significantly better outcomes as opposed to doing it. But this situation may, even if everything is normalized, the studies would suggest that you have to make it effort to clear the bile duct, otherwise, your taste will never be a problem. And there's about a 30 to 40% rate of recurrent attack, even in patients who undergo post sick. Is there going to happen in population based data? They have some modality, whether that's IOC, MRCP, EUS, intraductal, uh, intraoperative ductal ultrasound, or ERCP. Cumulatively, one of these approaches versus none of these was associated with that. So I think one issue here is that even if we say no ERCP is needed to be set for surgery, we are still obliged to look some other way to show what else. And then for who, that's not the situation you're talking about. No, I'm he's, so, he's talking about a different situation. No, 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 no. no, no, no. What, what I'm so saying now in the same patient, yeah, you, did you had two options, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One was you'd send the patients to surgery. Yeah. And then he, this patient came to me yeah. and I said, look, I haven't had an ERCP this week. Yeah. Yeah. Ek des to karu mein. So, when I went inside, the duct is normal. No duct is so, normal. duct is normal in someone who had passed a stone, who has passed the stone all the way, who still has small stones in the gallbladder. Now I am stuck. Now my problem is... But there is a time delay between your procedure and the colon. Now that is the key thing. If my patient is going to have a lap coli within 24, 48 hours, then I am okay with it. Okay? But if the patient is... I'm not sure that there's going to be a delay and I don't do a sphincterotomy and the patient has another stone that comes down and has pancreatitis, he'll say, look, you went in, you did bloody ERCP, sab kuch kar diya, uske baad bhi, I'm standing where I was. So personally, my threshold for sphincterotomy, correctly or incorrectly, is, is lower in these cases because of the fact that I'm not sure when they will have the lap coli. They may go to him and he say, no, 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 no. एक महीने बात करना वो शरियार के बस और ही शरियार आप कुछ कह रहे थे। This patient comes to me as a surgeon. Looking at the LFTs, I'm not going to do lap coli in this patient. I'm going to send it back to the gastroenterologist, either an MRCP or an ERCP. If the gastroenterologist tells me that he's not going to do an ERCP, I'll do an MRCP. If the MRCP is normal, still the LFTs are deranged, then I will look at the trend. I will not going to operate on this patient. I'll look at the trend. If the trend stays the same. Then probably this patient will need an ERCP. Sajda, we have we have the good thing we have is we have surgeons sitting with us. These are not the these are not the follow-up. These are the initial presenting. Yeah, that's what that's what I'm saying. Yeah, those are normalized. No, but the point the no. Yeah, trend is local. Ab normal ho gaya na almost. Ha, so then you see, but I I actually warned my consultants. Ha. What, uh, what? No, no. No, but what, what the point you're making, and I agree with you, that I also tell my surgeons, okay, look, we need to look. Because these are small stones here. The point Khalid made was they may have gone up, they may still be floating. Okay, we haven't, we, we don't know if the stones are number one. Number two, we don't know if there's debris there. Okay, and uh, so after doing all this, and the patient ends up coming back to you, you are in trouble. So I, the point we are making is that there is no right or wrong answer here. Aap Sajda. Sir, one thing I, point, I wanted to uh, say was that it's not just time to the surgery. If, uh, since we were talking about sphincterotomy, I would advocate that these patients should have sphincterotomy because if the cystic duct is dilated enough to pass the stone one time, even if the surgery is done within 24 hours, during the manipulation, when you're trying to take out the gallbladder, the, the, if there are multiple small stones, one might slip. So I think that this would be a better, you know, thing. I will give you an example. I did it in the U.S. Two small stones, and I did a lap colon. Okay. And the And I wanted to write back that those stones actually fell in the interval between my procedure and your procedure. Those were not retained stones. So this happens, you're absolutely right. It, that's why it's important. So, so if I go into this patient, 
if I decide to do an ERCP, and I'm not saying I'm right, but my view is that if I do an ERCP on this patient, I will do a sphincterotomy, period. Because I don't want this risk, hey, this patient's going to go for another lap coli, and we find out that he's now got a stone, I'll be really, really in trouble, although I always take pictures and make sure that I explain to this. This is, it's, the, the real important thing here is to take the, keep the patient in the loop and explain to him whether you do an ERCP or not do an ERCP, that patient knows why you're not doing it or what are the risks, what are the chances. And, and I think once you've discussed with them, they're pretty, um, uh, sorry, Aputa, the next case. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you my opinion in the end, but you yeah, guys. I think it's, the problem is, you know, like you have faced it, I have faced it, and I'm sure it's definitely a bit, we cannot guarantee. The problem is, there's no guarantee one way or the other that cutting alone, not cutting, or cutting and putting a stand in is going to be keep the patient out of trouble. But the increase in trust is the highest that it is. And that's why my practice they post a step to me or a new step. In your situation, when that patient, the guidelines are not required to go with respect to me during that index hospitalization. So, unless this is a severe episode of hepatitis, based on most published guidelines for hepatitis, that patient, the delivery hepatitis, should have had the post a step to me before being discharged. So, that's, I think that's part of it. Uh, but I would always put a step in my. In my do you put us as you've done an adequate synchrotomy, do you think you need to put a stand? I, we all agree with that. I would not. The reason why you may have had this problem again is that um, the, then you go back because the patient was acute pancreatitis. There's a little bit of a pressure when you're doing such an acute patient and maybe you know that synchrotomy that you had done was not adequate. Uh, I use the word adequate because the sphincterotomy should be adequate. Uh, it's not about large or small. Uh, I and mean stone disease. Stenting is different, obviously. Um, so, so, you know, this actually is an interesting case because these are real life uh, situations. Okay, we will do one more case and then we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing these in between. Um, admitted 46 <laughs> male, right upper quadrant pain, upper quadrant pain uh, altered LFTs. So again, cholestatic, LFTs, gallstones and sludge, CBD this time is 9 mm. Patient in, in, uh, came in for ERCP. Will you do it? Who says yes? Yes, why? So chance of I have another reason, and that reason is cost. So I do, and I, I have cholestatic LFTs. I have a dilated CBD, okay, and to me this is enough evidence that there's something going on in CBD, which is leading to this problem. Right upper quadrant pain, 46 male, so short history apparently. I'm sure it's not written here. So personally, I feel that you know. MRCP would add to the cost of our patient. Now, if the patient is affording and I have it available, then MRCP would be uh, good or EUS. If you have EUS, you do an EUS check and then immediately take, take them to ERCP. But all these have cost 
implication. So in our system, obviously in this situation, personally, um, um, you know, if, if I would not have any problem doing any RCP. about EUS in their setup, it's, you have to understand, the patient's actually coming for ERCP, same table, a scope goes in, they check stone, scope comes out, scope goes in, ERCP done, patient goes home. We're not talking about sending the patient for EUS, Something waiting like another two days uh, with this kind of scenario. So, so let's see what, what happens here. I don't know about this case. ERCP 9mm duct, CBD cannulated by double wire technique, PD was cannulated twice, sphincterotomy, no stone or sludge. Post ERCP patient developed pancreatitis, CT showed progressive post pancreatitis inflammatory changes with a 10 centimeter confluent inflammatory mass in the right alley fossa. Patient was in hospital for three weeks post ERCP. Post discharge, three to four weeks later, patient had lap cholestectomy, one stone noted. Histology showed features of chronic cholecystitis. So, you see, this is exactly what he was saying. Uh, now, this patient can take you to the this, clean to the cleaners. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And this actually shows the value. Here, looking with a different modality, the value of the so, like, had they come in and it's like late at night, you don't have to do that case that night. Next month, they're stable, they're not going to die. Check the other thing. And to be honest, the ERCP done here also is, is important. If you look at it, they went into PD twice. Yeah. Okay? And they cannulated with double wire technique. Now, double wire technique, depending on how deep your wire is, how, it, how rough you are with your wire in the pancreatic duct, it obviously increases the risks and issues. So people are, um, are saying that if you're going to use, some people say that if you're going to use double wire technique, then it's best you put a pancreatic stent. At the end. At the end, wait, do, do you normally do that? Uh, if I, yeah, in that case, I would do that. Especially if I'm uh, staying in the PD and the wire in there, whatever. So in this, in this scenario, a few things that are important, and then we'll cover up how do you prevent acute pancreatitis and what are the things that have shown some evidence. IV fluid, um, ringolectate is what is recommended. You, uh, our patients, remember, are fasted for longer. Sometimes we are fasting them overnight and doing the procedure in the afternoon, so that's late, kabhi list late ho gai. So fluid replacement is very important. Uh, NSAID suppository, we don't get um, uh, the, um, Indomethacin suppository here, so we use diclofenac. So all my patients who are, who I suspect in this kind of thing where we've used double wire technique, we always had put uh, diclofenac, and that's two. And uh, the third thing is putting a pancreatic stent. These are the three modalities available to all of us. If you've got your wire in the pancreatic duct, keep it there. Uh, again, put a stent and then go into, once you've got into CBD, you put the Okay, leave the wire in CBD, put the pancreatic stent, then continue whatever you want to do in CBD. Uh, the other thing that that was that I I was just I haven't read about it, but I don't know. Khalid, or aap log koi nitrates use kar rahe hain? There is some recom some some guys. I mean, you know, Bruno. Kya naam? I was your Italian guy, the Bruno, whatever his name is, Marco Bruno. Yeah. So 
so I, I'm not sure whether that, but, but at least in, in our practice here, we use three things, pancreatic stent, IV hydration, and uh, diclofenac. Yeah. So Is I, that? I don't know, yeah, I have a reservation about pancreatic. Uh, okay, so but I do it because it just gives, keeps me happy. Yeah, no, We've done everything. Just, uh, yeah, keeps yeah. my papers happy, my documentation, that's why. Yeah. Okay, we, we, we did our um, prospective uh, 500 cases here in our unit um, some years ago and uh, we were basically looking at pancreatitis and uh, all comers consecutive 500 patients we had 2.9 or 3 percent of so pancreatitis which is, is everybody's practice not so just you have to understand the risk of pancreatitis all the studies done 10 years from the before the risk of technique has advanced by miles. I've seen the evol evolution and I mean, you know, uh, it, imagine it started in 82, 83. So 82, 83 se 91 tak, hum wire guided equipment nahi tha maare paas. Fiber optic chal raha tha. You see, so you're looking at this and then doing ERCP. I mean, I did one about four years ago, three years ago, just because everything collapsed in our unit. And, um, and so uh, Akram said, sir, fiber optic hai. Maine kam marwa diya. <laughs> Patient, I had already cannulated. We were halfway and the, something happened, I can't remember, but the entire thing just went off. So we got this old system, fiber optic, and I, I managed to put a, put a stent, which was great, but then I realized, oh shit, you know, this is not the way to do it. <laughs> So um, obviously equipment has changed, accessories have changed, techniques have become much better, realization is there. Uh, we used to spend half an hour cannulating, nobody does that, no recommendation. There is, there is some uh, correlation between the time of cannulation and pancreatitis, so don't keep on messing up, don't make the ampulla red, uh, swollen. Um, if you're not sure you've cannulated and you inject, Make sure, I tell, this is my practice, I don't know what these guys do, but I have my technician. You're not going to look anywhere except the ampulla. So the moment, if I'm not sure, the moment there is a little bit of extravasation, they should stop. Okay, I'm looking at both, but I tell them, you're not looking at this, and you're only looking there. If, if I am in doubt, you know, when you have a little bit of cannulation and you think, yeah, no, I'm not happy. Happens very rarely, but sometimes, you know, you have extravasation. So when you're learning, Time mein aap kabhi zor se kar dete ho aur wo puri tarah se andar bhi nahi hua aapko laga andar hai aapne inject kiya and then and it's a big problem for then for anybody else to come and help you out it's not easy so with that um, and the tea here i think what we'll do is we'll uh, jump to um, khalid we want to do the talk first or should we do this first and then do the talk right cannulation ka na okay so where is our saj dot sajda ko bolte hai uh, in this course, by the way, we have no lunch break. We've canceled that. Um, this is all you get. Keep having tea and biscuits. And after 5 o'clock, you can go and have dinner wherever you want to. If you want to. We want you to go back home slim and smart. <laughs> that, that's also a part of the course. Yes. <laughs> Whether you learn or not, you'll go back slim. <laughs> in the meantime, koi, koi sawal, Sajda. What we were thinking was we'll go straight here and then after that because I might discuss no so let's go some do some practical stuff and then after that um, Khalid will no Khalid will uh, about uh, cannulation cannulation technique because that's 
five out of five cannulation technique. Thank you. 